Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Vice President and Managing Director, Booz Allen Hamilton, United Arab Emirates, Ramez Shihadi. I suppose we should begin, gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I've been asked by the organizers to just to apologize for the changes in the schedule, the compression in time. There are, as you have heard, some critical announcements that will be coming out uh, shortly. Uh, and so we will need to stick to a compressed time schedule. But before we begin, let me have the privilege of introducing our esteemed guests, our esteemed panelists. To my left, we have His Excellency Khaled Nigam, the newly appointed Minister of Communications and Information Technology. He comes with 30 years of experience in ICT with a focus on infrastructure design and development in Egypt and throughout the Middle East, and most recently was the chairman of the Egypt National Post. We also have, um, to his left, Amir, Dr. Amir Awadallah, uh, the co-founder of Cloudera, a US-based enterprise software development company. And previously, he was the uh, entrepreneur in residence at Excel Partners, and previously, vice president of product intelligence at Yahoo. And to his left, we have Dr. Shashi Busuar, the co-founder and CEO of the Institute of Globally Transformative Technologies and formerly of Dalber Global Development Advisors, where he's advised on topics ranging from healthcare to agriculture to human rights and climate change. Next to him, we have Mr. Ahmad Al Alfi, uh, who's the co founder, founder, and chairman of Sawari Ventures. He has an investment track record that spans 25 years and includes transactions from technology to healthcare to financial services and a number of IPOs on global stock exchanges. We also have Ali Faramawi, the corporate vice president of Microsoft Corporation. He started off here with Microsoft as the head of Microsoft in Egypt and today uh, leads Microsoft's global strategy uh, in emerging and high growth markets. And last but certainly not least, we have Walt McNee, the Global uh, Vice Chairman of MasterCard Worldwide, who is responsible for all senior uh, government relationships and is leading the MasterCard's evolving merchant strategy. Again, an esteemed panel that will discuss the topic of innovation and technology and how these will move the needle uh, on Egypt's most pressing challenges. So over the last two days, we've heard a number of common themes around these challenges, uh, from healthcare affordability uh, to the availability of, um, of, of healthcare provision to underdeveloped markets, uh, significant unemployment rates, traffic congestion, pollution in urban areas, uh, aging infrastructure or simply unavailable infrastructure, instability, and high illiteracy rates. We've also heard examples from around the globe on innovative solutions to address similar socioeconomic and environmental challenges, from Mumbai tackling its chronic uh, uh, traffic congestion uh, through real-time adaptive traffic control systems, to Finland reducing 40% of its waste collection through real-time networks of uh, capacity sensors, Toulouse and Abu Dhabi using social media feeds to detect and prioritize uh, and action infrastructure improvements. In fact, those improvements have reduced response times by over 90%. Indonesia leveraging wearables to improve evacu evacuation routing for disaster management. And global health agencies leveraging big data analytics on social media feeds to track proliferation of over 200 diseases globally. So there are many innovations to solve major problems. 
and, in e and Egypt has, in fact, a number of assets to leverage. The government has unwavering support for innovation. And in fact, very recently, President Sisi has, inform, has formed a presidential ca advisory council on science and technology dedicated to these types of topics. The population is large, young, multilingual, and spawns 350 uh, digitally skilled graduates every year entering the workforce. There's an attractive cost base for skilled labor versus the regions. And a multi multiplier effect is afoot on the back of many Egyptian startup success stories, and we'll have one with us here today, um, with a number of growing uh, uh, incubators and accelerators. And there is a demonstrable positive change in global innovation indicators. In fact, Egypt has moved nine spots to number 99 globally on the Global Innovation Index in 2014, and a staggering 49 spots to number 59 on the Global Innovation Efficiency Index in 2014. So to move the needle on the pressing challenges in Egypt, number of questions. How are we going to develop and foster a culture of innovation? And how do we translate these innovations, this culture, into successful ventures? And how do we leverage the infrastructure of, um, of the government and the public sector to contribute to this growth? And how do we leverage the big trends globally, whether it be in big data or in payments, to contribute to those improvements? And ultimately, how do we reduce, if not eradicate, poverty through innovation? So let's start off on the topic of culture of innovation. Mr. Faramawi, Faramawi. Microsoft established the Cairo Microsoft Innovation Center in 2007 which conducts research in collaboration with local interests across several areas of expertise in the Middle East and Africa. What are some of the lessons learned for local companies, multinationals, and government to leverage Egyptian ta talent in order to foster an innovation culture? Um, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very big effort. It's, it's something that, I mean, you learn every day, and the work, the starting point is, uh, is almost everywhere. So to some extent, it's, uh, it's a bit confusing, I would say, because the tone at the top is very important. Um, you know, we're, we're Egyptians, we love pyramids. There are two things about the pyramids. It's very, it's very clear what the importance of the, the top point, and also it's big kind of like infrastructure. Uh, and, uh, I was very excited that from the top, from the president, the establishment of the Council for Egyptian Scientists and Experts as you know, a way to use technology in order to solve some of Egypt's big problems. It was important for us at the Council to also bring to the matter that um, it's not all about large infrastructure projects, that innovation, new ideas, new business models, technology um, can always play a big role. One of the best moments was when we actually took a group of young entrepreneurs to meet uh, the president about um, um, two months ago, and he spent almost two hours with them. They were taking them through their um, success stories and what they learned, and it was amazing for even for the president to see the success they achieved. And I look for more and more examples of this and more from the tone at the top. Even our big Suez Canal project, where we highlight the importance of the project and the patriotism and what Egyptians done, did, I think we sometimes fail to highlight the innovative way, the innovation in raising capital for the project, because that was, that was pretty special. The second thing is around culture everywhere, in schools, in universities, in the workplace, in government, and the whole notion of trying new things. We have been brought up in many cases to be afraid of the unknown. We are very good in rewarding success. We try to be good in rewarding success, but we rarely think of rewarding failure. People who tried something new gave it a, their best shot and it did not work. And I think we have to bring in a culture where we can learn fast 
and learn from our failure and actually even reward that failure. And then a third part, which is around maybe the role of everyone and to really look around us and to see what's happening in this world and how not only technology and innovation is changing the world, but how we can be part of that and change that. In few years' time, the number of mobile phones will be four times the number of human beings. The ratio of phone to person will be roughly four to one. Ninety percent of the software written today, the applications written today, are offered as software as a service, as cloud-based. If you look at the whole size of the sort of like the digital world, all the information in the world, in 2020, it's expected that it will be 10 times of what it was in 2013. And it took the world, I don't know, 40 years to reach what we had in 2013, 2014. And in few years time, that will multiply 10 times, 10 times. So the opportunities and changes are everywhere. I think it's a question, do we want to take charge? Do we want to have a role or not? Excellent. And Your Excellency, what's the government doing to help build this culture? Thank you. It depends how do, how do you define innovation. Okay. If we are talking about technology innovation, so we are setting this in our university. We are setting innovation centers in most of our university. We are setting innovation in tech park, if we are talking about technology. We are one of the six countries in the, uh, in the world that are supporting uh, people with disabilities by building innovation centers for mobile applications for uh, disabled people. So this is if we are talking about technology. But I would like to define in innovation in a different way that we, we are living on it. If we are, would like to stop the slums that going around in every city, innovation is to build the new capital, about Cairo capital. <laughs> this is considered innovation. This is our commitment. Our commitment is, as said by Ali, that our state is committed by having a high council with the most and top notches uh, scientists on it, helping and supporting and advising the state and the president of building a new talent and a new solution for the whole country. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Your Excellency. So if the trick is to create a wave of active problem solvers, how do you find them and how do you encourage them? Sawari is a prominent investor in startups here in Egypt with stakes in a large number of organizations uh, headquartered and operating here. How do you discover these ideas? And how do you discover these people with great solutions for sometimes small problems that can have big impact? So we, uh, let me talk about innovation first. Uh, innovation really is the willingness to take risk. Innovation doesn't happen without taking risk. And you can never really see it at the beginning. It's a look back. So when you're sitting here, I can't say, this kid has, has an innovation, it's so great. He's already taken the risk if I can already identify it. The, the system that we use, we find, uh, we, we basically hung our flag out and told people we're looking for innovators and we're getting so many applications as an indicator of the depth of talent in Egypt. Uh, the, the first of all, the engineering and the educational schools here are fantastic, we have some great young kids, we get uh, we fund companies every six months. In the last four years, we funded 55 companies in Egypt, startups, uh, 20 some in Saudi, but, and seven in Abu Dhabi uh, just recently. All startups, all kids with brilliant ideas, some of the most, uh, first of all, socially conscious and 
things that are solving social problems, but other ones that are technological innovations, people that have come up with inventions. I think our combined companies have filed over 20 some patents in the US in the last few years. Sadly, that's a high percentage of the patents filed in Egypt or from Egypt. And our people are only filing patents on companies that are, uh, that are business oriented. They're not doing basic research. So, I mean, I send a clear message to everybody in the government. We need to fund basic research. We have some geniuses in this country that don't have the money to pursue their dreams. And we'd have a lot more patents and a lot more innovation on that side. Uh, and then uh, the last thing I would tell you is the funding of these people. The basic research is never funded by industry unless it's very specific in their industry, but has to be through universities and through government cooperation. That needs to be funded across the board. We fund development, we fund the next stage, we fund the startups, we're the risk capital that comes in after the fact. Uh, the government, again, is actually doing some amazing things in just the last few months. Uh, there's a couple of programs to filter the entrepreneurs and people who come up with ideas and identify him as this guy thinks he has an idea but he doesn't. Uh, there's a program between the social fund and I think it's the Ministry of Industry and in Talaf. Uh, there's another couple of funds that are being examined. Uh, the thing I would urge is that merging that with the people who are professionals at taking risk and funding the innovation properly and helping that develop in the country. Um, and maybe later I'll mention some of the specific examples. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. So, Ahmed, you were heavily funded. You raised over a billion dollars uh, for your, um, your startup, uh, which has become a tremendous success story, success story uh, with a valuation of well over $4 billion. Um, tell us your story. How did you get there? How did this happen? And what direction and, and advice can you give to aspiring Egyptian entrepreneurs with a similar dream? Thank you for that question, Ramiz. Uh, before I answer that question, I, I, I'm looking at the room and I'm seeing a number of heads starting to do, doze off and sleep. So I'm, I want to try and wake up the room a little bit, if you don't mind. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on the count of three, I would like us all together uh, to go to do this, to raise up our hand like this and say, go Egypt with the loudest voice that you can do. The goal is two things, to wake you up, but also to get some of the people outside to say what the heck is going on, and then they would come in as well. <laughs> okay, so together with the loudest voice that you have. One, two, three. Go, go Egypt! <laughs> no, that's not loud enough. <laughs> not loud uh, not enough. Good. Again, again. <laughs> again, really loud. This, this is the beginning of a great journey. One, two, three. Go, go Egypt! Egypt! Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> so, with that said, uh, Cloudera, the company I co-founded, we have been on a great journey in 6.5 years since inception. We now have more than 900 people working at Cloudera. That's 900 people sending their kids to school, families across the world that are getting their income from this company. In addition, as Ram has said, we raised more than $1 billion in capital. Uh, when I was interviewing with the reporters before this conference, they would ask, do you really believe Egypt can raise, can raise uh, $70, $80 billion? And I'm saying, yes, absolutely. If four guys, myself and my co-founders at Cloudera, was able to raise $1 billion, Egypt with 90 million people, they cannot raise $80 billion, $90 billion? I think they absolutely can. So in the startup world, it's very important to realize that we always have a trade-off between risk and reward, and we have to accept this. When I left, I used to work at Yahoo, as Ramiz said earlier, uh, before starting Cloudera. When I left Yahoo, my income was cut down in a quarter. My, I'm not gonna tell you how much my income was, but I went down from whatever it was to, to divide that by four when I went to start my company. However, the upside in the Silicon Valley and in the startup world at large, we realize that if you do make it, you do very, very well. 
And one of the reasons why I'm here today is to be that success story that uh, inspires many of the entrepreneurs in this company to take the risk of leaving their very comfy jobs and joining startups and creating companies that become a big success. Thank you. So with that said, I have uh, some advice I want to give to these entrepreneurs. I actually usually have a list of 10 commandments uh, that I give, but I don't have time to go over all 10, so I cut down the list to just four for, for the purpose of this audience. Uh, and hopefully, The top four something. is perfect. Go for top four. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so first, it's important to realize, as I said, this is a very risky business. Uh, only one of every thousand startups, only one from every thousand startups, uh, will achieve the level of success that Cloudera is seeing. In fact, 50% of them will completely fail. 50% of them will shut down, will fail. And that's fine. That's part of the startup ecosystem. Some of them will do okay, will do well, and very, very few of them will be able to achieve the multi-billion dollar valuations that we are seeing. That means that luck, and sorry for saying this in Arabic, Tawfi uh, min Rabbana, is very important as part of this. So my first advice to you, my first advice to you is to create a successful startup. And sorry for the, my, my English co-panelists, I'm gonna say this in Arabic and then. The most important secret to have a good startup is to ask our mothers to pray for us. The mother's prayers are extremely important. We need the blessings, we need the prayers, we need the support. My mother is among the audience and she is listening and watching and she can see what is going on. Our panelists are saying one of the very important things is to ask for the prayers of your mothers. Uh, because luck is a very big part of this. And I was fortunate to have uh, not one, but three mothers uh, praying for me. I, I had obviously my mother, uh, I had my, the mother of my children, my wife, and my mother-in-law, all praying for me day in and day out. <laughs> so now, so somebody in the audience is shouting out and saying you should ask them to pray for us too. Thank you. Actually, I have a request for all mothers in Egypt, for Egypt to succeed. All mothers in Egypt, please pray in, day in and day out. Pray for Egypt. So that's my first advice. My second advice is smart, hard work. Smart, hard work is essential for success whether that be for a startup or for the country overall, for Egypt overall. What do I mean by that? When you're starting a company, you have a thousand different things that you could be working on and you could be doing. When you're trying to start a country, you have a million different things that you could be doing. The smart thing to do is to pick the five things that will make the biggest impact and focus on working very, very hard on these five things. Hard work incredibly important. In Cloudera, in the first few years, we worked 80 hours in every week. 80 hours of every week. Sorry, again in Arabic. We need people to work, work and work hard. Thank you. My third piece of advice, I'm, I'll wrap it up quickly. I'm getting the sign to move quicker. Great team. It's very important for a company to succeed and for a country to succeed to have a great team. We all love football. In football, it's all about team play. It's all about every member on that team delivering their best performance. And if you don't deliver your best performance, you're off the team. Unfortunately, in our culture, we sometimes are afraid of firing people that are not doing well. That has to change. There is no, oh, uh, sorry for, uh, again in Arabic, his children, let him continue with the work, how he will manage. No, he has to do the job, otherwise we will look for somebody else. Thank you. My last one, I'm really sorry for going uh, so long. And my co-panelist said this more than once, and Nagib Sawiras yesterday in his talk said as well, we must not be afraid from making mistakes. You cannot innovate and you cannot find new, new solutions 
if you don't try new things. So Nagib Sawiras was saying some of our previous ministers, they went to prisons for doing mistakes. Mistakes because of innovation should be encouraged. Now, if you keep repeating the same mistake over and over again, then yes, you're stupid and you should go to prison. <laughs> but we al absolutely should allow you to try new things. So please encourage all of us to try new things and try to innovate so that this country can succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. I encourage you to grab Ahmed after the, uh, the talk here. He's got another six to go, which I'm sure would be very enlightening. So how do we take this attitude and, and this type of mentality into the public sector? Your Excellency, Post has a massive footprint and has done a lot uh, to innovate its services to the public. What's your experience and how do we build on that type of experience to create a fire within the public sector to bring innovation in public service? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, both uh, the post was a very uh, great experience and uh, it was a big challenge, really a big challenge. But as you said, around, around the resources, uh, the, the government's resources or the country's resources, the post has uh, the reach. We have around 4,000 branches. It is double the banking sector. We have uh, people like 50,000, but it is overemployed. Yes, yes, and the organization it's itself, it's it's full of fat. The problem is, as you said, Ahmed, is to transfer this fat to muscle, to make the example for the people to work and perform, and this is how we will gonna change the people in order to get a good result. One more thing is the incentive. The people has no incentive to work, nothing. What we have done yesterday, we are going to do today and tomorrow because they are not incentive. And I think with, with the new law, the new government, government law for the public services, I think we have to apply this straightforward for all government sector. The people should work in order to earn money. Who doesn't want to work, to stay aside. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, Thank you, Your Excellency. Shashi, from your experience, governments can't just be in the moment. They have to be ahead of the curve. They need to be thinking about the issues and the challenges three years out, five years out, ten years out, a generation out. What's the role of R&D institutions in being these agents of positive change and thinking about the innovations that are going to solve tomorrow's problems? Great question. Uh, if you think of some of the problems you outlined around health and poverty and food security and so on, you know, um, the, the traditional model of technology transfer, if you will, has been things get developed in the West and somehow over time their prices drop and they get adopted by markets in developing countries. Now, from an R&D agenda point of view, that is not enough for a country like Egypt. Right? If, I'll give you a, a simple example of a technology that a lot of low-income Egyptians, especially in rural areas, cannot afford and don't have access to, and that is uh, refrigeration. Okay? So right now, if you think of a refrigerator that's, that's e even, even the lowest cost re refrigerator that's available um, on Alibaba, for instance, it's still over 100 US dollars. But that is not affordable to a lot of the, uh, the, the people at the, the lowest end of the economic spectrum here. So the question is, how do you make a $25 fridge available? Um, you know, a company like GE wouldn't be interested in investing the kind of R&D required to fundamentally rethink refrigeration. Right? So then the question becomes, you know, where is the kind of R&D that will make this stuff available? Now, uh, we believe at our institute that 
in a lot of the, the national research labs in countries like the US, there is this R&D that's untapped for some other purpose altogether that can be repurposed to develop technologies like this. And if you think of that example, and coming back to your, your question, how does, how does Egypt and a country like Egypt think about its R&D agenda? Now, uh, it, there are three options. One is, can Egypt be a, a world pioneer in R&D? Now, unfortunately, probably not, because of the, the kind of you know, many, many tens of billions of dollars it, it requires. Option two is the fast follow-up, you know, like you have in, in India and China, where you see some technology that's relevant and very quickly you figure out how companies in, in your country can adopt that technology, make it, make, turn them into products and available to the market. Um, now, even that is not easy. It takes, uh, as you know, in India and China, there is a very large cadre of, of engineers and companies with great engineering capabilities. And, and the third option is, like, can appropriate policies be put in place to become very fast adopters? Now, obviously, in the long run, adoption isn't enough. Mm -hmm. But for the moment, I think one of the most interesting things Egypt can do is identify its pressing needs figure out which countries and which companies are actually developing those technologies, and then put in place policies to very quickly uh, absorb them into these markets here. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Walt, in the context of thinking ahead, MasterCard has really flexed its muscles over the years in innovating in the world of payments. And payments, whether it's a $25 fridge or something, uh, you know, more impactful on, on, one's, uh, on one's finances is, is of critical importance. What would you say are the most relevant innovations that MasterCard has been working on for Egypt? Um, well, thanks, uh, Ramez. I, I'd highlight one in particular. Uh, we've been talking about issues. Um, one of the issues that Egypt faces uh, is faced by many countries around the world, and that's financial inclusion. The fact is that only about 10 or 15 percent of Egyptians have access to uh, financial products and services, formal uh, financial products, um, which is a bad thing for Egyptians. It's a bad thing for the Egyptian economy. If you have to get on a bus and ride for an hour and then stand in line to, to make a bill payment, uh, that's, a, that's a horrible waste of time. That, that's the issue. Same thing if, uh, to, to make a remittance, to send money to a family member in Egypt. It shouldn't be time intensive. It shouldn't be uh, uh, a physical burden. So um, financial inclusion uh, is, is something we're, we're working on. Uh, one of the best kept secrets is that Egypt is, is at the forefront of this. And, you know, people will talk about M-Pesa in Kenya and other mobile money. Uh, apps. Egypt has something that's really quite extraordinary. Um, it is, um, it's available today, it's being used today. Uh, it's based on a platform that we put together uh, in Egypt, uh, which allows cards and uh, phones to coexist. We work with banks and telcos and with the post. Uh, what it means is that uh, Egyptians can use their phone for basic payments. They can make a remittance. They can use their phone at a, at a point of sale, at a merchant. They can uh, use it for internet purchases. Again, th th that's one of the economic impacts. If, a, if an Egyptian merchant can't accept electronic commerce, they're cutting out huge, huge markets, huge international markets. So. Um, this platform is there, it's available, it's, it's, it's growing, and I think the, the next incarnation will be when the government uh, issues a, an ID, a government ID. Um, that will, uh, through this platform, this will make basic uh, financial uh, capabilities available to, say, 50 million Egyptians. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a, an extraordinary thing, and I'd, I'd say that we're learning uh, from our experience in Egypt, working with government, telcos, banks, at the same time, we're finding the e Egyptian people to be hugely creative and 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 very collaborative. And I think that's and, part and of this the is success. available today. It's available today. And how do enterprises 
whether small or big, leverage this? How do they reach out? How do they make it accessible? Well, uh, I mean, these are commercial products, so, um, you know, there's some competition. Um, uh, one of the product names is Flus, um, which is uh, at Pissolet um, and, uh, you know, a bank partner. So um, it's out there today. I think you'll see it grow uh, over time. Excellent. So mobile payments is big, and we've seen Apple and Samsung and Google get into this space uh, quite heavily. Ali, what's the story with Microsoft? Is, uh, to use Shashi's term, are you going to be a fast follower, or are you going to come up with something big and, uh, and surprise everyone with it? <laughs> you know, it, I think the biggest thing really is around what, how do you enable people to come up with new things? And um, from a technology point of view, I think companies or people who are writing new software, whether it's using payment or for streaming videos or doing IT services, in fact, actually, even in, in this room today, there are examples of companies, Egyptian companies, that started with one or two persons, and now they are they have valuations of tens or hundreds, or maybe sometimes a little bit more, millions of pounds, hundreds of millions of pounds. I, I know that IT Works are here, OMS are here. Uh, Mashawir, which is a company that was set up, it's got nothing, it's, a, it's got a small technology backbone, but it basically helps solve the problems um, that we face every day by doing things on your behalf in, in, a, in a very crowded way. There's, there's an Egyptian company that is recently doing the solution for the police force of the nation in the UAE, um, using, again, mobile technology. Okay, Microsoft, I'm trying not to sell. You're pushing me to sell, but I'm trying not to sell. But I, using I wanted Microsoft you to make an announcement about Using this. Microsoft. But, no, no, seriously, I think uh, um, our, our guys here in our research center in Egypt have been trying different things. For example, the concept of a voice driven, mobile-based e-government services. Mm -hmm. So you can even solve the, the issues for the uneducated communities who have a very Illiterate. simple or, or feature, uh, feature phone. I think everyone in the country here understands the importance of the advanced infrastructure. I think the country gets it. We're doing a lot of work. This conference is another example of the importance of a vibrant investment climate the new law, how we've done it. So this is a second very important point. Two things I hope we never, never forget. Number one, people, people, the capabilities, the, the individual capability, the institutional capability, uh, uh, the learning experience, the school and what it does, the teacher and what, the, and, and, and what he or she does. I mean, just uh, we can never underestimate that. And no matter how good our infrastructure is, if we don't have that unique, special Egyptian factor, okay, the Egypt factor, the, the people, then that would be missing a lot. And then the other thing is just around thinking differently and innovation, Absolutely. innovation everywhere. Well, I think from an emerging market perspective, Shashi, you focused a lot on, on breakthroughs and what breakthroughs are all about and how they contribute to sustainable development. Building on some of these ideas, um, what in your experience do you anticipate is, in, is a great opportunity for Egypt? What will be the breakthroughs for Egypt? So going back to food security again, I think the single biggest breakthrough that, that a country like Egypt needs is uh, desalination. That is dramatically less expensive, less energy intensive than, than current technologies. Um, because this has an impact on, on, on water security, security in general, and, and food security. Um, a second one is given, again, uh, how much of Egyptian agriculture depends on groundwater. You know, a sensor to tell you how deep fresh water is under the ground. You know, if you dig in one place, the water can be 20 feet under the ground. You just walk a little distance and you dig. It could be 100 feet under the ground. Uh, so a sensor that tells you how deep it is, the, the, the usable water, could be very, very helpful. Now, I could go on, but I want to be respectful of, of your time, so I'll stop there. So these breakthroughs can help us, and the examples that you've given can help change the equation on poverty. Well, 
in studying cashless societies around the world, what's the promise of cashlessness in Egypt and the inclusion of, of, uh, of, of the impoverished into the economy through cashless platforms? Yeah. Um, I think a cashless uh, Egypt um, is one that is growing faster uh, than it is today. It's one where there's extraordinary government efficiency because you get rid of paper and, and all sorts of uh, inefficient process where the government can, can fund uh, with, through social disbursements um, a phone directly with, without, a, without paper and without lineups and all the rest. I think it just speeds everything up and I think it's that velocity that, uh, that, that makes a huge contribution. Plus it connects Egypt to every, every part of the world. It's, it's an instantaneous connection, commercial connection with the rest of the world. Absolutely. And Ahmed, how about your ventures? Are your ventures looking at payments as an avenue to have significant impact here in Egypt? We're looking at payments, but payments I would, I mean, uh, I put as one of the main things in social responsibility, but we have companies that are making money doing recycling of trash bags in a new creative way, uh, companies that are doing solar projects. We have an online company that is doing uh, video lessons of the public school curriculum. They're doing 100,000 lessons a day for free, giving it away. Um, I could go on for an hour about inspiring stories from the companies that I've been fortunate to invest in or work with and others that I know in the community. But I would just urge any of you who are interested in really being even more optimistic about the future of Egypt is to interact with those youth and to interact with those startups. And there's a great showcase of them for two hours later this afternoon in one of the rooms. Really, if you want to be inspired about the future of Egypt from the, bo from the bottom up, from the next generation, uh, and from the creative side, you should take a look at some of those companies. They're fantastic. Yeah, excellent. And Ahmed, maybe I'll give the final word for you. You motivated us at the beginning. Maybe you can motivate everyone here at the end. Um, in terms of your business and Cloudera, what will you do? What's your commitment to Egypt um, on the road ahead? Yeah, so, so two things. First, personally, I'm trying to help as much as I can with mentorship. I am uh, an investor in a number of companies here in Egypt and continue to support them with advice. Uh, now, that said, Cloudera, the business I'm in, we are in the business that's called Big Data. Uh, big Data is about leveraging all the information at your uh, disposal to create much bigger value and answer much bigger questions about everything. Uh, MasterCard, for example, we're very close partners. Uh, MasterCard has a solution that they uh, developed with us for doing fraud detection. You know, when you use your credit card, did somebody steal your credit card or is that really you? And that solution is now being used across uh, the whole world, except here in the Middle East. So please reach out to us, both us and MasterCard, uh, to see how big retailers here can, can use that. We also work with uh, telecommunication companies. So for example, BT, British Telecom, is one of our largest customers, not yet, not yet in the Middle East. Uh, we are big in the US, we are big in Europe, big in Asia. We'd like to see the, UE, the, 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 the Middle East start to leverage these technologies. Last but not least, governments. Governments are very heavy consumers of big data for uh, lots of purposes, for taxes, but also for uh, intelligence. The US government is a big user, the, the British government is a big user, and actually a number of the, the Gulf uh, governments are big users, but not yet in Egypt. So again, we would like Egypt to be more aggressive in adopting new technologies. Indeed. So we've heard a lot today about the challenges of Egypt and the promise of Egypt and the assets that it can leverage um, in order to move the needle and really bring the dawn of a new frontier in the country on the road uh, ahead. Um, we talked about culture of innovation, we talked about turning them into successful ventures, we talked about some of the big trends and what some of these companies are doing and ultimately how we can improve the poverty equation. It's been a pleasure to have this discussion with the panelists. Thank you very much. And perhaps in Ahmed's words,
We conclude with a couple of uh, yeah. Go Egypts. Would you lead us? No, no, you, go, you, go, you do it this time. Go Egypt! Go Egypt! Go Egypt! Go Egypt! Go Egypt! Go Egypt! Thank you very much.